Right, please turn to Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs chapter 6, I was telling the first service that uh, you know, I want to do one more message, which I'll do here obviously as well, uh, at least one more on this uh, second to the last of the deadly sins. Uh, these are deadly sins for a reason. The reason they're called deadly sins, the six things the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him, is because they're positively, absolutely deadly. All sin is deadly. The first humans, uh, in, they're in Eden. Uh, God said, the day you eat, you shall surely die. And they died. Uh, the Lord says, the soul that sins, that soul shall die in the book of Ezekiel. The Bible says, the wage of sin is death in Romans 6, 23. And it certainly is. In fact, uh, the mortality rate on earth is about 100%. I say about because you have only Enoch and Elijah that uh, survived death or didn't see death, but uh, it's basically a 100% mortality rate because of sin. Sin destroys uh, lives, it kills lives, but also is deadly to relationships. If you have relationships with other people, uh, when sin comes into those relationships uh, or you sin against that relationship, it's on the verge of dying, there needs to be reconciliation. Sin is very destructive. And as we look at this list again, we are at uh, uh, verses 16 through uh, 19, we're at the first part of verse 19 with the sixth thing that God hates. Verse 16, though, we'll be getting ready from, from verse 16. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. And we're at the beginning of verse 19, the sixth on the list, a false witness who utters lies. And last week when we got into this verse, I talked a lot about, uh, you know, what it means to utter lies and bear false witness on more of a practical level uh, as it relates to other human beings and what have you. And, and, and we didn't just talk about, you know, bearing false witness and what that is, but we also talked about how to speak the truth and what God calls us to do with our tongues and we, we got into kind of a devotional aspect of the message on what we're to do with our tongues and how we can have blessed lives and how we can be a blessing to others. Uh, however, this morning I want to talk about that verse again and kind of broaden it to the one who has been maligned more than any other, to uh, you know, the ultimate false witness. I want to talk about bearing false witness against God. Because that's a very, very serious thing. In fact, before you get to, and, and it's important, and we've got to keep in mind, in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments is, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. But before you get to that commandment, when you begin the Ten Commandments, you're, you're called to have, we're called to have no other gods before the one true God, and we're called not to use God's name in vain. And there's a lot of different ways people use God's name in vain. Uh, one way, of course, is to, uh, you know, attach his name to a cuss word, is to use his name out of anger, is to damn somebody in his name, uh, you know, by your authority. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can use his name in vain, but one of the ways that people use God's name in vain is by falsely attributing acts to God that don't belong to him or not giving God glory and credit for his creation or the things he deserves or assigning uh, false doctrines to the true God. And we're called not to use his name in vain. And there have been more blasphemies and more malignments against God than any person who ever existed. We have to be so careful with that. Because even God-fearing people can run amok in their minds, and even when they think they are being logical, can end up using God's name in vain. They can end up saying things against the Lord. And if you say things against the Lord, you end up in trouble. In fact, even Job, I mean, Job was the most blameless man on the earth. However, he had said some things that he regretted. In fact, God, when he appeared to Job in the whirlwind and said, Job, basically, who do you think you are? I'm the creator of the entire universe. You know, I'm the one who measured the universe and, and all these different things. It says that Job put his hand over his mouth. And it's, uh, we're told there, uh, the God says to Job that you are trying to come down on me. You're trying to, you're speaking evil of me to justify yourself. You see, Job went through a whole lot of trials. And there was a lot of misunderstanding as to what was going on as 
is true of many of our trials. And by trying to justify himself, he started to, he didn't, he didn't curse God and die. Satan was never able to get him there, but he started questioning God. And the Bible says, woe to those who quarrel with their maker. So Job put his hand over his mouth. He realized, I better shut up. I don't know what I'm talking about. And he was trying to be careful. But even in trying to be careful, he went over a line that God himself appraised as being dangerous. Although God in the end said it was Job's friends that spoke wrongly and not Job. Job's total assessment was not wrong. Although within that assessment, he went into a dangerous area And we need to be very careful because God takes this stuff very seriously. In fact, in the book of Jude, the last book in the Bible, right before the very last book, Revelation, we're told that when the Lord returns with the thousands and thousands of his saints, that he will come to execute judgment on uh, the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds that they have done, all their perverted acts, and for all the ungodly things they've said against God. So he's going to judge the wicked, not only for what they've done wrong, but for the things they're saying against him. And there's a lot of judging that's going to go on because there's books now out by atheists that are becoming more and more popular and there's all kinds of blasphemous books against God. And we need to be very, very careful that we understand that even Job, the most righteous man on earth, God corrected. Moses, he was the most humble man on earth, amen? When God chose him, it says him he was the humblest guy on earth. That's why God chose him. Yet we find him hitting the rock twice when he was supposed to just speak to it so the water would come out. And then we hear him coming down on Israel in a really, really aggressive way with anger. And God says, you misrepresented to me, me to the people. That was not my heart. And therefore, you will not go into the promised land. God takes these things seriously. We need to make sure that what we say about God is accurate. And we need to make sure we say it with a proper attitude. After all, we are called living epistles. We are living letters, it says, read read by men. We're called to be the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that believes me will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. But then he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. He said, not to hide our light under a bushel. He says, a light that's on a city, you know, can't help but be seen. And we're supposed to let our light shine, amen, for Jesus. And since we are supposed to shine the light, and since we are letters that are read of men, what letter are you? What kind of letter are we? There's Matthew, there's the Gospel of Mark, there's the Gospel of Luke, there's the Gospel of John, you know? You know, then there's, you know, other Gospels out as well, accounts. Not the Word of God, but other accounts of who Jesus is, you know? There's, you know, the Gospel of Marcy, there's the Gospel of David, there's the Gospel of Emmanuel, and, you know, there's, in other words, what are you saying? What is your life saying about Jesus Christ? Can someone look at you and say, that person loves God. That person fears God. That person is a true Christian, and I'm convicted. And that, when I'm in that person's presence, they make me feel like, you know what? Uh, there's something going on with this God thing they're talking about. Or are you someone where they say, that person claims to be a Christian, but man, you know, their life is just contrary to Jesus, and they're a hypocrite. What are people reading when they see your life? You want to make sure that they see Jesus, amen? And we have the power by the Holy Spirit to allow that to happen in our lives. I don't care what circumstances you face, what situation you are in, you can be a witness for Christ. You can be a good or a bad witness. If you're a Christian, you are one witness or another. Everybody here is a witness. What kind of witness are you is the real question. And we want to make sure that we are not being a negative witness as to who Jesus is because I don't want to bear false, false witness against God. I know when I come up and I speak or when I'm on the streets and I witness to the lost and I share with anybody, I have a fear and trepidation before God that I'm going to answer for him and I want to make sure I get it accurate. I want to make sure I get it accurate because I love him and I praise him, but also the Bible says very clearly, it says, let not many of you be teachers for teachers will receive, receive a stricter judgment. So we've got to be really careful and really concerned here. However, all of us, whether you're a teacher or not, are called to be witnesses, and all of us will be judged regarding how we witness for the Lord. In fact, look at what the Lord God says in 1 John, a few books before the last book, uh, Revelation. 1 John. That 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. In 1 John chapter 5, we read a very, very powerful declaration about making sure that we are not bearing false witness about God. 
In verse 9, we read, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. See, there were certain false teachers, insurrectionists, who had come into the churches that John had set up uh, there in Asia Minor, and they were seeking to deceive the Christians into believing in a Gnostic version of Jesus, a false version of who Jesus uh, was and is. And he says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. And then he goes on to say, that the, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Do you have that testimony? The one who does not believe God has made him a what? Has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his who? Son. Verse 11, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. That's the Christian testimony, man. Jesus Christ is the son of God and that life is in his son and what Jesus and what God has said about his son. And if you disagree and you say God didn't send his son and so forth, you are bearing false witness and calling God himself a liar because God is the one who's testified who Jesus is. Throughout the Old Testament, you have prophecy after prophecy about the coming Messiah, you see. And in Psalm chapter 2, it talks about how to the leaders of the earth kiss his son, kiss God's son. In the book of Proverbs, it says, do you know who God's son is? And there's many, many prophecies about the Son of God coming. And in the New Testament, the Word becomes flesh. We see the Son of God manifested. And there are literally over 500 witnesses that see of Jesus' disciples that see the resurrected Christ after he's just mutilated and crucified in the worst way you could die in those days on a cross. And they sealed their testimony of who he was and is in their own blood. John, who wrote this book right here, was one of those apostles who sealed his testimony. They tried to kill John. He didn't die when they tried to kill him. Then they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos, which according to Revelation 1, which is where he received the book of Revelation. And John gives his testimony about Jesus and as being the Son of God and being the life. You notice here it says that Jesus is the life. Look at verse 12. He who has the Son has the what? The life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. If you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. You may say, well, wait a minute, Joe. I'm listening to you. I can breathe. I have life. You don't have eternal life. You don't have spiritual life. You're separated from God. You're alienated from God. You know, you're, 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 you're in, in a bad position because you're separated from the living God on the day of judgment. You'll be eternally separated from him in a Christless, in a Christless eternity forever and ever. However, if you have Jesus Christ, you have the life because he is the life. You see, the Bible tells us in John, not first John, but the gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the same was the beginning with God. And it says, and I talked to Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness a few days ago, and my, my, my son and myself were out, and little Josiah and I were, uh, uh, I saw this gal, and she had this book, and it looked like it said Jehovah something on the front cover. And I went up to her and said, hey, you know, does, are you a Jehovah's Witness? And she said, yeah. And I said, I thought I saw Jehovah in the front of the book. And, and, I, and I started to talk to her about who God is. And the whole thing with the Jehovah's Witnesses is that the real name of God is Jehovah, and you have to use the name Jehovah or you're not properly following God. And I just talked to her about, you know, how Jehovah is not the Hebrew name of God. In fact, there's no J and even in the Hebrew alpha, alphabet. There's no J, like for Jehovah. And the, the name of God in, in the Hebrew text is the Tetragrammaton, which is YHWH, which is best pronounced Yahweh or Yehwa. We don't know what the vowels were. We have the consonants. So if you want it, the closest you could probably get is Yahweh, the Hebrew name of God. But I also let her know that she didn't have to get hung up on that because in the New Testament, because they don't like it when Christians refer to him as Lord or God. But I point out to her in the New Testament, the Greek, inspired Greek writing of who Jesus is, over and over again calls him Theos and Theon and Kyrios, which are the Greek words for God and Lord, and they're generic words because it describes what God they're talking about, the one true God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, amen, the Son of the living God. And as we talked, I told her, we talked about John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. And I know that Jehovah's Witnesses put was, and they add the word a there, a God. You won't see that in any of your translations. I don't care what translation you have, unless you have the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Translation, which I incidentally call the New World Abomination because it twists the scripture over and over again. But I told you, if you go on reading what it says, the very next verses say that he, everything that was made was made by him and nothing that was created was created but by him. But then it goes on to say he was the life of men. See, he is the life. Later in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And in John 11, Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life. Right? He that follows me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen? And here we see that he is the life. He is the eternal life. In fact, look at John chapter 1, 1 John. Same book we're in. 1 John chapter 1. And look at the first couple verses. As to who Jesus is. What was from the beginning. What we have heard, verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 John, not the gospel of John. 1 John. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Notice what Jesus Christ is called right there. The what? Now he's called the what? Eternal life. Notice that? We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, God manifests himself in the flesh as the Son of God, the eternal life. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life because he is eternal life. If you reject Jesus Christ, you reject eternal life because he is eternal life. And eternal life is only found in God. He's the author of life, the prince of life, the Bible says. And you need to make sure your trust, your faith is in Jesus. And throughout the testimony of scripture, he is the son of God. And we have to be very, very careful because there are many false testimonies about who Jesus is. There are many false Christ out there, many twisted versions of who Jesus is, and you need to make sure you have the Jesus of the Bible. This is the one that, as John says, that we touched, that we held, that we beheld with our eyes, you see. They had seen the resurrected Christ. In the Gospel of John, when you read chapter 20, you see Thomas, you know, you see, you know, Jesus saying, stick your fingers in the holes of my, my hands and, you know, my side. And, and, and then, you know, Thomas, when he sees his wounds, he falls down. And he says, the Lord of me, the God of me, he calls Jesus God right there. And Jesus says, as the Father has sent me in John 20, so I send you. Yet even as the disciples were sent out to testify that, of what the prophecies of the Old Testament had said, the fulfillment that was taking place in their day, there are many false teachers that went out to deceive the people. Jesus had already said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are as ravenous wolves. And here in 1 John chapter 4, we are warned. Look at 1 John chapter 4. John warns his readers about the deceivers. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is already coming, or that it is coming, and now is already in the world. And this Antichrist spirit would come proclaiming either Jesus wasn't the Christ, or, or with all kinds of claims, even claims that Jesus isn't the Son of God. In fact, in 1 John, back up to chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 18, children, it is the last hour. Verse 18, and just as you have heard the Antichrist, that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out that it would be shown that they were really not of us. But now check what he says out. Check out what he says in verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, 
And you all know, know what? Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies what? The Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide, remain in you, which you heard from the beginning. That's the gospel. If what you heard from the beginning abides or remains in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise which he himself made to us, what? Eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to what? Trying to deceive you. There are concerted efforts made not just by humans, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principles and powers, but the demonic spirits, as we read in 1 John, that have inspired false prophets to go out and teach a different Jesus. Teach that he's either not the Christ, or he's not the Son of God, or he's not Lord. Because we learn by the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 that it's by the Holy Spirit that we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. There are a lot of different Jesuses out there. We have to be so careful become the, because they come packaged not with horns that say beware. This is a false doctrine. That's not how these false doctrines come. They come with pithy little titles and they become very popular even in the church and you've got to be very, very careful. You know, there's a very popular book out there right now called The Shack. How many have heard of The Shack? Raise your hand popular book. There's a lot of churches that are reading the shack instead of the Bible, you know? There are Bible studies around the shack. It's, it's all over the place. It's a, a, a bestseller within the evangelical Christian church. And to me, it's very concerning because there's a lot of stuff in there that bears false witness against Jesus Christ. You know, it presents God as a, a petite Asian woman, uh, and that's the Holy Spirit, supposedly, and, the, uh, and then Jesus is like this this character who is supposed to appeal to, you know, the average, you know, American white boy, you know, because he's like, you know, he's this klutzy kind of guy and he, he likes to, you know, garden and cook and stuff like that. And he laughs at crude jokes and, you know, and he just kind of, it's like, you know, this isn't the Jesus of the Bible. And it's strange because, and then the God, the father is this, you know, like this Oprah Winfrey kind of character, this heavy, this overweight uh, African woman is God, the father. And then you get these different words put in, in the mouths of God the Father you get, or the words of Jesus that aren't biblical. Because you can bear false witness against God in more ways than one. One thing you could do is you could say, thus saith the Lord when the Lord never said it. Or you can write a book like the Shack and put your words in the mouths of Jesus and claim that they're from him in some way and lead people astray. And it's very, very dangerous. Because you see, 1 John was written, and if you have a study Bible, you could just consult your introduction and probably see it. in most of your introductions, you'll find that 1 John was written to combat Gnosticism in the early church. And if, you, if you're familiar with the setting in the latter part of the first century, Gnostics were those who sought to hijack Jesus, you see. They said, oh, Christianity is spreading. And they said, oh, no, this is who Jesus really is. He's not the Christ, the Son of God, He's just a way shower, you know. A, a, a spirit came upon him, came upon Jesus, a Christ spirit, you know, came upon Jesus, the man, just like it could have came upon any of us. And Jesus was just a man. He wasn't the son of God, you know, the savior of mankind. And this Christ spirit just used Jesus. And this Christ spirit is not the Christ of the Bible. By the way, Jesus Christ is the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Jesus, you can't separate Jesus from Christ. Christ means anointed, and Jesus means God saves. He's anointed one because God saves. God became a man to die for us. He's the son of God. But the Gnostics were saying, you know what? Uh, and they had some really strange heresies. But uh, John, we're told about what John came against by Polycarp and Irenaeus. Polycarp was a church father that was under John's teaching. Irenaeus was under Polycarp's teaching, and Irenaeus was the top apologist, church father of the second century, defending the truth of the gospel against Gnosticism. They point out that 1 John was written against the Gnostic doctrines. When you look at what the Gnostics taught, and you read 1 John, it's like a hand and a glove fitting perfectly. It's like, wow. 
And the Gnostics were claiming to have special revelation from God that, you know, that Jesus Christ, Jesus was just a man that the Spirit came upon and before, uh, in, at his baptism and then at his death, you know, many of the Gnostics taught, like Serentis, which was a heretic that John actually combated in a bathhouse. In those days, they had bathhouses where a lot of people just bathed. They weren't like San Francisco's bathhouses. And he came in, Serentis, with his disciples. And John the Apostle, we're told by Irenaeus, said, let us leave, lest the bathhouse house fall upon our head, because the enemy of all truth has entered into the bathhouse, meaning Serentis and his disciples. Because according to Irenaeus, Serentis is the one who developed the teaching that Jesus was just an ordinary man, and a Christ spirit chose him and came upon him at his baptism and left him before the crucifixion. And the crucifixion wasn't for our death, for our, for our salvation. That Christ spirit was just to show us how we can become gods. Sound familiar? And so John is combating the teaching that would, that would strip Jesus of his uniqueness as the Son of God. And one of the primary teachings in Gnosticism was that the way to salvation is not through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God, but it's through knowledge, gnosis. Hence, Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis. Gnosis. It's the word no comes from gnosis. And the Gnostics were into knowledge as being the key. In fact, Adam and Eve, when they were sinned, when they sinned at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that wasn't a sin. That was a tree of knowledge to show them they were gods. That was a good thing. See, everything is reversed. Satan becomes good. Even Judas, you might have heard a couple, about two years ago, the gospel of Judas was discovered, a Gnostic gospel. And Judas becomes a good guy, you see. And Irenaeus and the church fathers tell us that the Gnostics inverted everything. They turned everything upside down. The evil people that Satan inspired in the Old Testament became the heroes. Just like Satanism today. Everything is backwards. And they, say the, say, they say they are father backwards in Satanism today. Everything got inverted in Satanism. And Gnosticism was the beginning of Satanism as we know it today. Anton LaVey, uh, the founder of the Church of Satan, now Lester Crowley, they were in the Gnosticism. Crowley, Crowley did what he called the Gnostic Mass. Well, all this is rooted in what the Bible comes against as false, diabolical, demonic teachings. And we need to know what the scriptures say so we're not deceived. See, the Gnostics, they said, Satan, well, no, it was Sophia. Sophia, the goddess Sophia, channeled the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Because, you see, Sophia was created by this primary God, ultimate depth, and she couldn't know him. It was forbidden to know the ultimate depth. So Sophia became very angry, and she said, you know what, I'm bummed out that he won't let me get to know him. So in my anger, I'm going to do something ruthless. And she creates another God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And he's a monster God. And he, you know, so it's all mythology is what these guys are into, Gnosticism. So Sophia creates this monster God with, a, with very, a whole lot of power, but a low IQ. And he creates the physical universe. He creates the physical earth. He creates you and I, physical beings. But guess what? Since he's an evil God, according to Gnosticism, he's trapped us all in bodies. We're not supposed to be in bodies. That's bad. We're in prison. We've got to be set free from our bodies. That's why the gospel of Judas was, Judas was a good guy. He was having Jesus crucified, set him free from his body. That's why you have uh, like men like uh, Donald Walsh, who wrote a bestseller, and he's been on Oprah Winfrey and what have you, uh, called Conversations with God, where he says when the Jews were killed, it was a good thing because they were like butterflies being released from their cocoons. You see how twisted this gets? All of a sudden, murder can become justified. Judas becomes a good guy. Satan becomes a liberator because Sophia, when she sees the world, has been created by Yahweh. She says, wow. I'm going to go and channel the serpent and tell them if they eat from the tree of knowledge that Yahweh doesn't want them to eat from, they'll become gods. They'll realize that they're gods in embryo. And, they'll, you know, and so she channeled the serpent, according to the Gnostics, and said, you shall become as God. And according to Gnosticism, Satan really becomes Sophia, and Satan is the savior of mankind. And that's what Satanism basically teaches. But guess what? 
You think Satanism is kind of a new development just from hundreds of years ago or just... No, man. It has its roots in ancient Gnosticism. There's a spiritual cosmic war. There's a cosmic war going on in this world for the souls of hearts and uh, souls and hearts of men and women. It's a big war going on. And you're only set free through God's way, through His terms. And that is that we all, because of our rebellion, along with Lucifer or Satan and all the other rebels against God... We all deserve death. And that's justice because I've sinned. I've blown it in my life. I've sinned against God. And then I come to the knowledge of that and I recognize, wow, I've done my own thing. And God's justice is to put me to death. But because he's a good God and he loves me, God becomes a man and dies in my place, pays that penalty so I could have eternal life. That's the good news. And you know how you can prove very easily that Gnosticism is a false doctrine? is because it's not rooted in history. You don't see Gnosticism until after Christianity in the latter part of the first century. In fact, here's here's how you can know that the Gnostics hijacked Jesus. Remember Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code? Way popular. That's it's all Gnostic. The key to the treasure in that book is not the cross. They use a combination cross. That's not, that doesn't work. But guess what works? Apple. Read the book. Don't read the book. But it's Apple. You know, then I'll send, boom, they get the treasure. And it's at, you know, this pyramid in the Louvre Museum, which is not 666 window panes, but Dan Brown says it has 666 window panes. Why 666, Mr. Brown? Why the apple? It's the same spirit at work. And they've hijacked Jesus. And how you can know that is Gnosticism claims to be following the true Jesus, but the Gnostic Jesus is not rooted in history. If you read the Gnostic Gospels, and I've read through a lot of Gnostic teaching, you go to the Nag Hammadi Hammadi text on the internet, and you can see the Gnostic Gospels. You know, I have Gnostic books, but I've gone to the internet and read through their Gospels about Sophia being the liberator, channeling the serpent. The more than one of their Gospels, it's like, wow. And same thing the church fathers said, that they would worship snakes because they symbolize the serpent who supposedly gave them wisdom to become gods. And when you read this stuff, you're like, wow, this is the popular stuff that's out there today. Even the, the secret, it, was, it kind of piggybacked or coattailed on Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. And Sophia becomes this, you know, in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, Sophia is one of the main characters as she's initiated into Gnosticism. But you know what? It's pretty simple. All we have to do is say, before Gnosticism arose in the latter part of the first century, what did the Bible say? For 1,500 years prior to the rise of Christianity and Gnosticism as to who the Messiah would be. And we see in Psalm chapter 2 and in Proverbs and elsewhere that he would be the Son of God. And we see in Isaiah 53 that he would die for our sins. When you read Isaiah chapter 53 in the Old Testament, written over 500 years, closer to 700 years before Uh, Gnosticism even became a known thing. You read that the Messiah we we cut off from the land of the living and bear the guilt and sins of his people. Amen? That's not the Gnostic Jesus. See, the Gnostic Jesus is not found in the ancient prophecies, guys. He's made up. And so this whole Sophia thing, which represents the personification of wisdom and Gnosticism, is evil. However, when you open the shack up, which is sold at all these Christian bookstores... And it's very popular. Guess what? You get to page 171 and you meet a woman by the name of Sophie who's a dispenser of wisdom. And Mac, one of the main characters in the book, The Shack, he has to go to this dark cave to meet her so she can give him spiritual wisdom. And her name is Sophie. Sophie? What's, you know, come on. That's a personification of of Satan according to Gnosticism. And it's just heartbreaking when you read this kind of stuff. And that's, now we're back to the shack. I've gone full circle. And I know I've retraced some of the things we talked about a couple years ago, but I did that so you'll make the connection and say, wait a second, what's going on here? I don't believe God inspired. I don't believe for a second he inspired William Young to write Sophie as this personification of wisdom into his book and to be a dispenser of wisdom to Mac. You know, as this woman is teaching him 
and guiding him and what have you. In fact, what's heartbreaking is if you look at that book, listen to what it says on page 182. Listen to what Jesus supposedly says on page 182 of this book. Tell me if this is biblical or not. And these are ways of bearing false witness against Christ. In the shack we read, Jesus supposedly says, quote, those who love me come from every system that exists. They are Buddhists or Mormons, Baptists or Muslims. I have no desire to make them Christians. Wow. I mean, that's just one. I can, we can spend the rest of the, the, the morning on, on the shack, which I won't. I want to spend it on the Bible. But you know what? That just is like, what are you talking about? That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Amen? And in, in John chapter 20, verses uh, 20 or 30 and 31, it says, many other signs did Jesus. And if, he were, if everything was written that he did, it says the libraries of the world contain the books. And it says, but these things are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that knowing this, you may have eternal life. That's the message of the gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the way. And as far as being Christians, well, guess what? People don't want to be named after Jesus anymore. Jesus said in the last days, you'll be persecuted because of my name. Amen? And so in the emerging church and all these people that are trying to become one with all their religions but say, claim that they're still followers of Christ, you know, they don't want to be named after Jesus. Oh, yeah, you know, it's a bummer. We've got people that have been named after Jesus who have given Jesus and us a bad name. But you know what? We gave the gays the rainbow. I'm not going to give, them the, I'm not going to give the Gnostics the name of Jesus, okay? I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to hold on to Jesus. In fact, in the New Testament, we read in the book of Acts, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And then it talks about them suffering because of his name. Peter says, if any of you suffers because, you, because of being a Christian, you see, the term Christian is a biblical term. It's what we've been called for 2,000 years. Yet, we're told in the shack that the Muslims and the Buddhists, you know, they love Jesus. And in loving Jesus, you know, I'm not trying to make them Christians. Wow. But don't you understand? The Bible foretells that there would be an ecumenical movement, a one-world religion that would come under Antichrist where everybody would be gathered together, that those who would be persecuted in the end would be who? You'll be persecuted for my name's sake, Jesus said. They'll put you to death because of my name, he said in Matthew 24. And I have to prepare myself to suffer for the name of Christ and to speak the truth in love because our hearts need to love God enough to, to speak the truth as to who he is. And we need to care about people enough to say, hey, this is what's right. This is what's wrong. There's a difference between good and evil. There's a difference between truth and error and the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Yet we're told today that, you know what, you know, you know, it doesn't matter who you follow. All religions basically say the same thing. We're all basically one. That's a lie. And we know that's a lie. But I'll tell you what, it's important that you understand. Probably one of the biggest lies out today, which is taking over much of the earth, is Islam. 1.5 billion people, just about, claim to be Muslims. That's almost one-fourth of the earth, guys. And it's growing and growing and growing. And you'll notice what happened recently here. With, it's going on right now as we speak. There's a war between uh, uh, you know, Israel and uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip there. And crazy things are going on. Thousands of rockets were falling on Israelis' heads or in their territory for years, for six years now. Even after the so-called ceasefire, right after the ceasefire, Hamas started, kept their rockets going. It's been happening that way ever since. But there's a lot of false witnessing going on about who God is by Islam. Things being said about God, which is not true about the true God. In fact, what's interesting is Islam has a lot of its roots in ancient Gnosticism. A lot of people don't know that. I say 99.9999999% of Christians don't have a clue about that, but that's the truth. Keep in mind, Islam did not start until the 7th century after Jesus. The New Testament was closed in the 1st century when Christ came. 
Islam didn't start till for 600 years later, folks, after Jesus. And when it started, it took parts of the Bible, took parts of Judaism, took parts of Christianity, and it took parts of the ultimate enemy, enemy of the Christian church, Gnosticism. And Muhammad wedded them together. He wasn't a literate man. He heard all kinds of different stories from Christians and Jews and Gnostics, and he brought them together. And he took his chieftain god. His god was one of many gods, by the, that the pagans worship, but it was his tribal God that he said, no, we're going to follow this one. He's the true God. And blood began, began to get shed of those who wouldn't follow his God, Allah. But what's interesting about this is I, I, was, I was blown away because when I was reading the Gnostic writings as I got more and more to you know, know my enemy and started looking at the Gnostic teachings more, I started seeing within the Gnostic Gospels, which arose prior to Islam, Jesus, for instance, making a bunch of clay pigeons and then blowing on them and then coming to life and flying away. Uh, teachings like that. And that Jesus isn't the Son of God. Teachings like that, which you read in First John. But then when I read the Quran, which I'd read some years earlier, but then I started seeing the significance, I start reading about how the Muslim version of Jesus makes a clay pigeon, claps his hand, and it flies away. I go, wow, this sounds familiar. I read this in the Gnostic teachings, which came before Islam. And there's more. I can give you other examples taken by the Quran, taken by Muhammad and his followers, where teachings from the Gnostics found their way into the Quran, which I won't take my time to do, except this one. The Gnostics taught that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Islam teaches that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. If you don't have the son, you don't have the what? Life. And if you contradict God on Jesus being the son, you make God a what? According to 1 John, a liar. Islam makes the true God a liar. Don't tell me that Christianity and Judaism and Islam are the three great, wonderful religions that have come from Abraham. Islam did not come from Abraham. It came many, many centuries after Abraham over 3,000 years after Abraham. And it bears total false witness as to who Jesus Christ is as a son of God. Well, why can't we just all be one? They love Jesus. You Christians love Jesus. We all love Jesus. No, it's not the same Jesus. If I tell somebody about you, but I say you got a big horn sticking out of your head, you know, and that you bite people and, you know, you're a vampire and you're going to kill them when you see them, would that really be describing you? Don't raise your hand, please. You know? <laughs> no, it wouldn't. I would be having a false version of you. That wouldn't be you at all. So if you say, well, Jesus is a prophet, but he's not the son of God, according to 1 John, the very, the very thing here is he that does not believe the Father and the Son is Antichrist, it says. And he that says that God doesn't have a son, 1 John 5, makes God a liar. I'm sorry. I cannot be compatible. There's a, uh, there's a, Muslims and Christians are writing back on the common word document that Muslims wrote. Christians responded going back and forth so we can be one and bring world peace. World peace? You really think that's going to happen? If you're the United Religion, it's going to be under the Antichrist, the Bible says. And people like Robert Schuller and Rick Warren and others have signed that document that we have the same God. That's what that document says. That's scary stuff. It's not the same God. I've got to speak the truth. Oh, it's not popular. But Jesus said, woe unto you. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you because they spoke well of the false prophets. But he said, rejoice when you're persecuted because they persecuted the true prophets of God. You want to stand with God. Your life is a vapor. You're not going to be here long. You're going to stand before God. You want to make sure you're on his side. Amen? And that you proclaim the truth. So I'll tell you what, man. To me, this is very, very, I mean, when you have the shack saying the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Christians all have the same God, right? But distancing them from Christianity at the same time, you have some serious problems. When this becomes one of the best-selling books within the Christian church, it has been the best-selling Christian book for a long time, but it's not really Christian. It's a counterfeit. You have to be really, really careful, guys, with Christian fiction. I'm telling you that right now. And the, and the better the writer is, you, the more concerned you need to be. Okay? Okay, he says this from, you know, 
You've got to be really concerned and test everything with Scripture. Amen? Test everything with uh, the Word of God because there's a lot of false witnessing going on out there. It says that Israel would cease to be a nation. The Word of God says that. Then Israel would become a nation again. We know that. But then it also says Israel would just become a, a nation again, which, by the way, you know there's not one people group that has survived more than three generations without being a country and continue to exist as a distinct people group and then become a nation again? Not three generations with Israel, almost 2,000 years. And the Bible said it would happen. And it said they would rise again. And it says they would rise from the ashes against all odds. They'd get their language back, their pure language, it says in Zephaniah. And by the way, they didn't speak Hebrew anymore. They spoke German and Yiddish and Landino and all these different languages. When the Jews were coming back to the land in the 1900s, fulfilling that prophecy, the only one that spoke Hebrews, Hebrew were the rabbis and the scholars in Judaism. Kind of like Latin today. Nobody speaks Latin. It's not a common language. But scholars, some scholars, you know, know Latin. But you had Ben Yehuda. There he was. He said to his kids, I'm never saying another word to you in German or Yiddish, only in Hebrew. And he'd only talk to them. And he's, he settled in Israel. And he, and he started speaking to them. And, that's, and then all of a sudden they started learning the Hebrew and they started speaking to their friends. And guess what today? The language of Israel is, guess what? Hebrew. God says he'd restore to them their pure language. I mean, there's so many prophecies like that. But not just that. They'd become a world power again. And in Zechariah chapter 12, go to Zechariah chapter 12. In the Old Testament, quite, quite deep into the Old Testament, you know, if you go to Matthew in the first book of the New Testament and hang on the left, it's just a few books over, one of the bigger books. Chapter 12 of Zechariah. It says that they become a world power. Do you know that Israel today is about the fourth world power, guys? On the earth, there's, over, there's hundreds of countries, guys. They've been around just since 1948. 1948 is a crazy year. A lot of interesting things happened in 1948. They became a country again in May 14th of 1948. Significant things happened in 1948. The transistor chip was developed by Bell Labs in 1948, from which a lot of our, you know, it's where our communication technology flows from the transistor chip. The West European Union was developed in 1948. Significant things. in and out hamburger started in 1948. Okay? I don't know how significant that is, but I think that's cool, you know? But 1948, man, was an interesting year. There's a lot of things. I've seen lists that are like hundreds of things long. You know, some things not very significant at all, but some very significant things. Dead Sea Scrolls were found just before 1948, 1947. But it's interesting because God said Israel would rise again. And I would love to, I don't have the time to, to go through a ton of prophecies regarding Israel. We've gone through some in the past. We will again. But I want you to look at chapter 12 because of what's going on with Gaza right now. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. He's saying this is the one who created everything and created you. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling. That's happening today. Throughout the earth, there's reeling because of what's going on over Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the most disputed piece of real estate on the earth, guys. It's another prophecy being fulfilled. I mean, you have to be, you have to you have your eyes closed if you can't read these prophecies and say, whoa, the Bible says this? The Bible says this will become a country again? The Bible says Jerusalem would be a cup of ruling for all the people around it. What do you think the Muslims are so all upset with the Jews for? One reason is because they want Jerusalem. Because they consider Jerusalem the place of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which are on the Jewish Temple Mount, as one of their most holy sites. And it's the most disputed territory on earth. Verse 2, Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes ruling all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And by the way, there's been sieges going against Jerusalem for years now, guys. The, the thousands of rockets that have been uh, flown over towards southern Israel, Jerusalem's in southern Israel. Iran, by the way, you have to know, Iran is the one that's fueling Hamas. Okay, Iranian Persians aren't even Arabs. Okay, 
It's not about Arabs and Jews. It's about Islam and the one true God. And they've been fueling, I mean, and now they're getting rockets that are going further and further. Rocket just recently didn't, just was, didn't fall far from Tel Aviv. They're getting closer and closer to northern Israel with these rockets. And what does Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, what does he want to do with Israel? What does he look forward to? He says Israel is going to be wiped off the what? Face of the earth, and he's seeking nuclear weapons. And they're fueling Hamas. Well, it says that it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be what? Severely injured. In other words, Jerusalem will be like a heavy stone. You ever try to move a really heavy stone? It's really hard. And, and when you do it, you've got to be really careful because if it falls back down, you can get really injured. And they're messing with Jerusalem and trying to move it. And there's a lot of injuries going on right now. They'll be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will be what? Gathered against it. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. You know, here in Simi Valley, we, you know, the local paper is the Simi Valley Star for Ventura County as well, the Ventura County Star. And one of the headline articles says, uh, Israel continues to push into Gaza despite international, the, the international outcry. Now, isn't that interesting? The international outcry against Israel. Yet if you and I, if we lived in San Diego... And Mexico had been raining rockets upon our heads for three years, thousands of rockets. Do you think the United States would sit back and do nothing for three years? Absolutely not. Who do we think we are to say it's wrong for them to try to defend themselves? And I'm not saying every way they try to defend themselves is right. But I'm saying they have the right to defend yourself if you're getting nailed with rockets. In fact, if, you, if, you're, if you're a man at your house and they're firing rockets at your kids, your next door neighbor, and you do nothing and say, oh, I want to be a pacifist, I'll call you a coward to let your kids get wiped out and get killed. Israel was trying to show as much restraint as they could for a long time. Six years, that's right. Over 6,000 rockets. And now they started gaining momentum and they started creating technology and rockets that were going further. And they also know that it's just a matter of time before, you think Iran is going to fly over Israel and just drop a nuke? No, they wanna, they're going to do it. They're going to try to do it through Hamas or through a terrorist organization. That's their plan. Should Israel wait around until that happens? Well, it will come about at that day that I'll make Jerusalem, verse 2, verse 3, a heavy stone for all the peoples, and all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Every nation, that, including us, we're a nation, guys. The United States eventually will turn against Israel. I'm concerned regarding the coming administration and where that's all going to be headed. Without getting all into that, that's kind of scary too. Verse 4, in that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and the rider with madness, but I will watch over the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the uh, Lord of hosts, their God. In that, day I will make, in that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a what? Like a fire pot among the pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves. I don't know of anything like that in history besides technology that we have today when you see what it describes. So that they will consume, look at what it says, so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. They'll consume them. How will they consume them? It says in Zechariah 14, two chapters later, that the nations will, that are surrounding Jerusalem, all the nations will panic and start sending their warfare at each other but you know before jesus christ could come back there would have to be weapons of mass destruction you know how we know that because jesus said in matthew 24 that if he didn't return when he's going to return no flesh would be saved on the earth and we read in zechariah 14 two chapters later that when these weapons fall upon them while they're standing up their eyes will be consumed from their eye sockets and their tongues from their mouths that couldn't happen back then when this was written, guys. Prophecy should get your attention. They'll be consumed. And now we know, you know, hydrogen bombs, they 250 million degrees. Neutron bombs. Neutron bombs are meant to kill people, but not structures. Because they want to preserve the structures 
and get the structures. That would be the very kind of thing they would want to drop on Jerusalem because they want the, mount, they want the holy mountain. They want, they want the holy sites, you see. And see, neutron bombs, which a few of the countries have, including Russia, who's backing Iran, who's backing the Moss, neutron bombs are designed where you're standing up and they just melt your flesh off your body. Yet the scriptures say here that's not going to happen to Israel ultimately. It's going to happen to all the surrounding nations that come against her. I don't want to be against Israel. God says to Abraham, those who bless you, I will, be ble- well, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. All the nations will come against Israel one day. And they're going to be like a fire pot. And people are going to be consumed all around them. And do you think it's a coincidence that Israel became a nation again? And they're a world power and all the world's coming against them right now? I mean, Europe is run by the liberal media over there, BBC. I, I just heard a spokesperson for the prime minister of Israel a couple of days ago. I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before. And he was talking about, they're talking about, how come you won't allow us to go in with you into Gaza? And he said, because what, when we went in Lebanon, we brought you guys with us and you gave away a lot of what we were doing with your cameras and stuff, and they knew how to fight us. And he says, plus the BBC, this is what the spokesperson, for the prime minister said, plus the BBC, the Associated Press, they're on the side of Hamas and the Palestinians. See, world opinion is coming rapidly against Israel, despite what happened in the Holocaust. It's growing and growing and growing and growing as we speak. And this is exactly, you guys, I don't doubt at all, not a smidgen, I do not doubt that this is the word of God. It's, it's like way more current than your newspapers. Read it, you know. Wow crazy what's going on. And, and it's a lot of false witnessing going on. Not only as to who God is, you know, but I mean, the Temple Mount, that's where the Jewish temple had been for years. What's built there now? The Dome of the Rock, Golden Dome, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Two different ones. I've been up there two different, of my, I've had a few trips to Israel, but my last trip and my very first trip, I was able to go up there. Jews aren't a lot up there. It's patrolled by, you know, Jews aren't allowed up there. Muslims are patrolling it, and Muslims go and visit these things, and they make a lot of money on their pilgrimages. I mean, they give money to these, the Muslims that run these things on their pilgrimages in the, in the years past. And you go up there, it's like, wow, this is... Jesus said that the times of Gentiles would take place and that Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles were completed. And you see it getting trampled underfoot. By, and the, what are these places? are places of worship for Allah. And what does the Al-Aqsa Mosque say? Allah says in Arabic, Allah has no son right there on the Temple Mount. Which in 1 John, that's the very declaration of who? Antichrist. And the one day the Bible says, Jesus said the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And he says, I've come in my father's name, see father, son, and you receive me not. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive. All the world's being set up for this. But guess what? A man is going to emerge on the, sea, on, on the scene. And he's going to be just, oh man, this is going to be such a great leader. And he's going to seem to solve the Middle East problem. And the Middle East is going to become peaceful for a little while. Because it says he'll make a covenant for seven years. But in the middle of that covenant, he'll set himself up in the temple of God as though he's God. Jesus called the abomination of desolation. So when a man arises and you see a seven-year covenant, watch out. Because it says in the middle of the seven years, he'll break the covenant and that he'll set himself up in there. What interesting timing. We live in very interesting times. And by the way, why would Jerusalem be one of the holiest places for Islam? Isn't that like Mecca? Way far away? Why do they want Jerusalem? Why do they want the Temple Mount? Satan has always wanted to be God. Right? And he can't be God. He's been thrown out of heaven. He can go back and forth now, but he can't hang out there anymore as a resident, as a family member. But he wants the holiest place on earth, which is the Temple Mount area. And that's why he's going to empower Antichrist. And he's going to sit in the temple. But I'll tell you what. Islam did not teach 
I mean, think about it this way. Who does Israel truly belong to? Who is it truly given to? We have records that go way back farther than Islam. Thousands of years before Islam, we find out that God did give the promised land to the Jews. And guess what? Even the Quran, even the Quran teaches, the early part of the Quran, it says that the Muslims helped the Jews escape from Pharaoh and help them settle in their land. Wow. Why? And you know how many times the Bible mentions Jerusalem, which is called the city of God in the Bible? Over 800 times it mentions Jerusalem in this book. You know how many times Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran? Zero. I've got a Quran. It doesn't even say you won't even find Jerusalem. But you see, later, hundreds and hundreds and, or thousands of years after the temple was built, hundreds of years after Christ, several hundred years, all of a sudden it becomes a holy place to Muslims. Why? There's a few different reasons. In fact, it's interesting when you think of Yasser Arafat, uh, his uncle, Haj Amini al Husseini, the uncle of Yasser Arafat. By the way, Yasser Arafat, the you know, PLO, you remember the Palestinian Liberation Organization? You know, Yasser Arafat wasn't even from Israel, wasn't Palestinian. He's an Egyptian. And you know, his uncle was the leader of the Arab world under, when Hitler was around, and he was a Nazi. You could, type, you could type in his name, and you could see him meeting with Hitler, doing the Heil Hitler thing, and there were people under him. You could t- go, to, go to YouTube. Just type in uh, Yasser Arafat. Type in Husseini, his uncle, who was the leader of the Arab world, and you'll see him saluting Hitler with the Nazi salute and giving troops to Adolf Hitler to help exterminate the Jews in the Middle East. You guys, people are not being told the full picture of what's going on. They want to destroy Israel. And I mentioned Thursday night, I challenge people to just go online and just type in, type in Hamas, and then type in covenant. And look at their covenant. Look at their charter, what they believe. Now keep in mind, Hamas was elected by the Palestinians, so-called, in the West, in, I'm sorry, not the West, not the West Bank, but in uh, Gaza, were, uh, they were elected to lead them. They were elected. And keep in mind, too, that polls that have been done among those in Gaza Strip about sending rockets upon civilians in Israel, up to 80% have voted, yes, let's keep doing it. So don't think that, hey, it's just, just Hamas. There are a lot of bloodthirsty people over there that are sending their kids and brainwashing their kids from the, the minute they can hear to hate Jews. And Jews are called pigs, just like Hitler and the Nazis used propaganda to dehumanize the Jews and call them rats and vermins. They're being called pigs, which are the most unclean animals, according to, 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 to Muslims. By, they're being brought up with that. And you'll read the very first paragraph, the very first paragraph of Hamas's charter. It basically says, too bad for the Jews and the Christians. It says, too bad, basically, for the people of the book. The people of the book, they're talking about the people of the Bible. Remember, the Bible came long before the Quran. And it's talking about the Jews and the Christians. That's the people of the book throughout the Quran, the Jews and the Christians. Too bad for them because they haven't submitted to Allah and his wrath is against them. And then the same paragraph goes on to say, the very beginning of their charter, of their, of their covenant, okay? Uh, and you can go to memory, M-E-M-R-I. You can type in, I challenge you to do this, type in Hamas covenant memory, M-E-M-R-I. That's Middle East uh, news media's memory. And they're Muslim. And they give you an English translation of the covenant that they feel is acceptable. In the very first paragraph, it says, Israel will continue to exist until Islam destroys it. Their charter is about totally eradicating and destroying Israel as a country. And in Psalm chapter 83, it mentions 10 different nations that will say, let us wipe Israel out from being a nation. That's what's happening, guys. Are you hearing this stuff in the news? Not much. And even in the covenant, if you go on and read it, it says the only time they'll seek peace with Israel is when they need to rearm themselves. Hamas is sworn to the utter destruction of Israel. It's not an Arab-Jewish thing either, guys. I know it's not. I've been to Israel. I've befriended several Arabs in Israel on three different trips now. Arab Christians, Christians that are Arab are not strapping bombs around their kids, sending them into buses, guys. 
It's the Muslims. The Iranians are not Arabic. They're Persian by descent, but they're fueling Hamas because it's an Islamic thing. And within that same covenant by Hamas, which rules the Gaza Strip right now, within that same covenant, they quote a hadith. A hadith is a, is a tradition. They quote a, uh, the popular Muslim hadith, which is quoted in mosques all over the earth, including mosques here in our state and our country, where Muhammad said that every last Jew needs to be killed. And the rocks and the trees will cry out and say, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. And that judgment day will not come until every Jew has been killed. That's in that charter. So do you see what Israel's facing? It's a little bit different than what you might think when you listen to CNN or you read the New York Times. They're facing a people that wants to obliterate them from existence who are being fueled by one of the other top superpowers, Iran, who's trying to get a hold of nukes and wants to wipe them out of existence. By countries that are surrounded by, like Syria and Lebanon from the north, and those of you in the Israel trip, the last Israel trip, we went, you can see them. In fact, we went to the south. And you're standing in Israel, but you look to your left and you see Jordan. You look straight ahead, you see Saudi Arabia. You look to your right, you see Egypt, you know, Sinai and so forth. And you're standing, you see four countries at once because you're in Israel. And you realize everybody around them has been influenced to one degree or another by Islam and wants to obliterate them. And little old Israel, which is half the size of San Bernardino, are told you guys have too much land. When the Arab world and the Muslim world has... It's crazy. You say, yeah, but you know what? There's some Arabs that should be rightfully upset because they've lost their homes to... You know, they were kicked out of Israel, da 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 Well, look at it closely, guys. And I'm not saying there's not some fine points that need to be tuned. But Israel became a, a nation again on May 14th, 1948. And you know what happened at that time? Right when they became a nation, war was declared against them by the surrounding nations. Right away, they're already at war. Just became a country again. Wow, prophecy takes, that's fast. And you know what? The, the, the Muslim nations around Israel told the Arabs that were living there, and keep in mind, the, the Jews didn't just show up in 1948, guys. There were hundreds of thousands of Jews living there before 1948. The Palestinian orchestra, so-called Palestinian and Palestinian was a name given to Israel because Hadrian, the emperor, after Israel was dispersed in 132, they were dispersed in 70, but later more of them were dispersed in 132, he gave it the land, name Philistine land because that was the name of their ancient enemies. Palestinian means Philistine land. It was named by a Roman empire who hated the Jews. There were no Palestinian people in history. There were all kinds of different people that lived there through the centuries, but God had already given it to the Jews, read chapter 12 of Genesis, read chapter 7, read where God says from the Euphrates to the Nile. I mean, it's a lot bigger land that he's given them than they actually occupy, folks. They occupy a very small part of the promised land right now. And you know what? Even, uh, I, have, I have a huge book. It was given to me by Ted Walker in my last trip to Israel. And it's basically the front page of every cover of the Jerusalem Post for years prior to 48. Through the Nazi Holocaust, it's a trip because you're reading, it, you know, the front pages as these things are, Jews start to get persecuted in Germany, and then all of a sudden there's a Holocaust, and you're just, but you know what? It's not called the Jerusalem Post. It's the Palestine, it's, it's a Palestine. But guess who it's about? It's the Jewish people. It's Jews, that, it's their newspaper. So if, 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 don't be deceived into thinking, well, it was all Arabs there, and then the Jews got there in 1948. no. People don't have a sense of history. Well, what about the Arabs that left? They should all be able to come back. Well, you know what happened there? The surrounding nations, and I had a discussion on top of the Temple of Mount with a woman from America, a Muslim, who went to visit and went into the Golden Dome. And I believe the Al-Afka Mosque as well. And I started to witness about who Jesus was to her. And I talked to her about there's a false witness going on. I asked her, who is it? Who is it that uh, uh, inspired Muhammad to write the Quran? Gabriel. Okay, if it was Gabriel, this happened when? The 7th century, right? Yeah. Well, over a thousand years before that, we have one appearance of Gabriel in the Old Testament, and just a few hundred years after that first appearance, we have one appearance in the New Testament, two appearances of Gabriel, prior to him supposedly going and inspiring the Quran. 
a thousand years after, the, over a thousand years after the book of Daniel was written. You know what he said to Daniel? And I've shared this with some of you before. He shared with Daniel that the Messiah would come and be cut off for the sins of his people. And he gives the very year that the Messiah would come and be cut off. However, Islam teaches that Jesus Christ did not die for the sins of his people to make atonement. However, it says there he will make atonement. Islam teaches that didn't happen. And then the next time you see Gabriel, again, now almost 600 or so years before Muhammad claims that Gabriel appeared to him, you read it in Luke chapter 1 and 2. We celebrate. It's called Christmas. Gabriel appeared to Mary and says, You shall bear the Son of the Most High God. Gabriel said that the Messiah would be who? The Son of God. Then this angel claiming to be Gabriel appears to Muhammad and says, Jesus didn't die for the sins of the people. And Jesus is not the Son of God. Who's the real Gabriel? Come on, folks, it's pretty easy. I, you test the counterfeit as a Johnny come lately that claims to be the, the orig, off the original. You test it with the original. Plus, the Apostle Paul in Galatians says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he died for our sins. And he says, even if an angel preaches another gospel to you than that which we preach to you, let him be eternally what? Condemned. Even if Gabriel, even if it was the same Gabriel, he just changed his mind, he's in big trouble. He's just another devil then. But it wasn't the same Gabriel. I don't believe at all. It was a lying spirit. In fact, even Muslim scholars say that Muhammad felt he was possessed by demons, that he would be on the ground writhing, foaming at the mouth. They'd cover him with a blanket. He thought he was possessed, and he was going to throw himself off a cliff over and over again. He went through this. And his wife convinced him, no, you know what? You're really hearing from Gabriel. The angels appeared to you. That's what's happening. Come on, guys. But when you're a young child and you're taught that Allah is the only one true God, and you're only taught that, and you don't have, you're not, you're not testing it with the scriptures, it's hard to know truth from fiction. Praise God. And some of you had seen the documentary. But praise God that uh, Hassan, the son of the founder of Hamas, the very founder of Hamas. We talked about him if you were here a couple weeks ago. The very founder of Hamas, his son, became a Christian, is living in San Diego. We might have him speak at our church next month. Pray about that, okay? And bring a bulletproof vest, okay? <laughs> we'll see. Pray, pray about that. We might be able to pull that off. We're going to see what God does. But you know what? He said that when he was in, he says a Christian tourist witness to him and showed him where, you know, went to a Bible study and saw where it says that Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus said, love your enemies. And it blew him away because that was so different than what he'd learned about the Jesus of Islam. He learned about, from a, about Allah and everything. And you know what he said he did? He went and he went in the wilderness for three years or so and compared the Bible to the Quran. And he came out realizing the Quran was a lie and has become a Christian since then. And he was the president of, his, of, of Hamas's youth, his dad's right-hand man going wherever he, his dad spoke. And he knows he's a target right now, but he says, I know the truth now. He's been set free. Praise God. Amen. So we need to keep in mind, now the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, why are they there? Because Satan wants that area. Oh, Muslim said, well, uh, guess what? Uh, Muhammad he ascended on a horse from this area. That's why it's sacred to us now. It wasn't mentioned. Jerusalem's not even mentioned in the Quran. Well, it's sacred now because Muhammad, you know, he ascended from a horse there. And that lie came much later. And that's because Muslims wanted it for a pilgrimage place so they can make money. And that's because they also don't, they want to prevent the Jews from rebuilding the temple. Okay? And by the way, that lie was propounded in the 1920s and 30s by the uncle of Yasser Arafat, Husseini who was a Nazi and wanted, was sworn with Hitler to exterminate, exterminate the Jews. I'm trying to give you the big picture. And I don't know about you, but to me, that's what church should be about. What does the Bible say and how does it relate to today and where we're at? Amen? And we need to know what's going on because we're being radically deceived here in America about what's really going on over there. They don't see the big picture. It's very easy to show a picture of a child who's been mutilated by a bomb and say, oh, look at the evil Israelites. But they don't often tell you that the bombs, that the rockets that the Hamas is firing are firing from schools, they're firing uh, from mosques or, or adjacent to mosques. 
In fact, uh, it came out later, it wasn't until a day or two later, that the New York Times and Associated Press came out and acknowledged, you know what, the, the school that was hit, yes, rockets were being fired from either in that school, that UN school, or directly adjacent to that school. That came out later. You're not told those things first. And, and then these things come out later, and you're like, wow, just keep this in mind. I think it's very important to understand. It's the Muslims, not the Christian Arabs, not Arabs. Arabs aren't bad. We're all bad. We all need Jesus, amen? But I mean, they're not like, it's not because someone's Arab, they're bad. There's beautiful Arabs that love Jesus that are the sweetest, nicest people you'd ever meet in your life. Some of the Arab, Arab people are the most loving people. But when Islam, like a disease, gets a hold of your heart, you can be transformed and become more and more hateful. The Muslim, the Arabic Christians are not the ones doing the bombings, guys. And if it happens, it'll be an anomaly, not the norm. I'll just leave you with this to think about. Mansour. Mansour was an Arabic, a Drew, really. <coughs> a Drew. They're very fierce warriors. In fact, he told me that he's in the, he was in the Israeli army as an officer. And he told me, he said, Joe, he said, you know, uh, the, the Muslims would much rather have a Jewish soldier get a hold of them than a Drew. Because we go back hundreds of years and they've killed our people for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's why we live in the mountains. And I've been told by different Israelis that the fiercest soldiers among the Israeli troops are not the Jews, but the Druze. D-R-E-W-S. And he became a Christian, thank God, because the Druze have a very strange religious system. And he said, Joe, think about it this way. He said, what would happen if all the Muslim nations surrounding Israel were to lay down their weapons? What would happen to those countries? And I said, nothing. He goes, you're right, Nothing. Israel wouldn't harm them at all. He goes, however, what would happen if Israel laid all their weapons down? And I said, in one night, they'd be destroyed. He goes, that's exactly right. That says a lot of what's going on. And I'm not defending Israel as though Israel is righteous, but I'm saying there isn't moral equivalence between the two sides either. Okay, guys? Israel needs Jesus. Hamas needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Amen. Praise God you have Jesus. If you're a believer, you have the Son of God. You have eternal life. These prophecies are being fulfilled. And it says a little bit later in Zechariah chapter 12, you can look at verse 10, I will pour out, this is in the Old Testament, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only what? Son, there he is again. And they will weep bitterly over him. And the at the bitter weeping of the firstborn. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when he comes back, the Jews, this is in the Old Testament, they'll see the one that they've pierced. When does this happen? After Israel's surrounded by all the nations, and all the nations try to destroy Israel, and they're consumed. Jesus Christ comes back, they see him who they pierced. Wow. Wow, it was you all along. Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And, be, and it says, Paul said, I tell you a mystery, don't only be ignorant of this mystery. All Israel will be saved. Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and following. But I'll tell you what. He also says Israel is only those ultimately whose hearts are changed by God, who become true Jews, he says in Romans 2. You and I can only have eternal life if we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen? If you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have Jesus... You don't have life. That's his testimony. I'm just repeating it. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are on a greased pole to hell. You are going down fast. But he loves you so much that if you turn from your sin, you say, Jesus Christ, I know your word is true. All the prophecies are so clear. Forgive me, I'm a sinner. I know you're the son of God. I want you to come into my life. I repent. If you embrace Jesus, you will embrace eternal life because he is the life. Amen? If you want to do that today and you're not saved, if you're not saved, you need to ask Jesus Christ in your life right now. Simply pray, Father, forgive me of my sins. I am so sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm so sorry that I've ever said anything against you. I know you are a radical, holy, righteous, loving, caring God. Forgive me of my sins. I do believe that you sent Jesus Christ in the world to die for my sins. I believe he died and rose again on the third day. And I confess him as my Lord. 
Thank you for eternal salvation, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.